Okay. So we continue and we use the notation we assume so far. We take this power series, summation a k z minus a k. We assume that the radius of convergent is r. We also denote it by f1 of z the series obtained in this way, take k, a k, z minus a, k minus 1, k, k greater or equal to 1. Right? We already observed that the two series have the same radius of convergence, so also the second one has radius of convergence r, and then we in some sense we decide to split fz as sn z plus Rn of z, where Sn of z is the expansion up to the uh, order n. So it is a polynomial. And the remaining part, Rn, is the tail in the power series expansion. So Sn is the following. So it is A0 plus A1 z minus A plus A2 z minus a squared plus plus a n c minus a n. Okay? So we observe as well that if we define s prime of z to be a1 plus 2 a2 z minus a plus plus n a n z minus a n minus one. We can also sorry this is s prime n right. We can also <coughs> define f prime f one of z to be the limit of s prime n of z. Okay, by definition. So uh, as I said. We wanted to prove that starting from a power series a function which is defined as a power series expansion with the radius convergent R, this function is complex differentiable. So that we consider the incremental ratio, and this is given Z naught. such that, well, first of all, as I said, we can take a equal to zero, and this is without loss of generality. Then we can take z and z naught to be smaller than rho, which is smaller than capital R, the radius of convergence. Okay, so everything. <coughs> if, <coughs> if z and z naught are given with these assumptions, this function here is well defined for z different from z0. For any z, this is defined, this is a number, this is a complex number, so this is the difference of two complex numbers, and this is the quotient of two complex numbers. Okay. On the other hand side, we want to prove that this becomes very close in the topology we introduced to f1 of z0. Hmm? And so we can consider the difference, and we have to show that the modulus of this, this difference tends to zero as z tends to z naught. And to do so, <coughs> we, we recall that f of z were, was split into two parts, the finite part up to the degree n and the infinite part, the series from n plus one to infinity. So we rewrite everything like this, And then we divide everything as again. So this this fraction in this way. <coughs> then we subtract and add s prime 
n is in naught. So, here what is left is the following Rn of z minus Rn of z naught over z minus z naught. Okay? Because of the triangle inequality, the modulus of this is the modulus of this, but is smaller or equal to the sum of the moduli, this plus the modulus of this plus the modulus of this. And if we show that these three uh, moduli are smaller than epsilon, epsilon over three, of course, if you want to be very precise, so you show for z tends to for z close to z naught, huh? then you show, well, then we show that this incremental ratio has a limit as z tends to z naught f one of z naught. Okay, so we are <coughs> left to to conclude the following. So. This is smaller or equal to, with the notation so far introduced, uh, what I said, uh, first test. Huh? Okay. <clears throat> this is, as in, calcul in real calculus, formally the definition of derivative, and this can be made smaller than epsilon if c is close to z naught. This comes from the, this is also infinitesimal as n tends to infinity since uh, we are considering what? That f1 of z0 is the limit as n tends to infinity of s, pri s prime n. The difficult part is this, which is an, infin an infinite uh, sum. So it is the series. We have to see if this series converges to something which can be considered small. But remember from the definition, Rn of z is the sum of a n c to the power n, sorry, <coughs> a k with k greater or equal to n plus one. So it's as I said last time, it's the tail, so the part, the remaining part, not the, po the polynomial. So that if we consider this difference, this is in evaluated in z naught. So if we consider the difference, and this is what we are doing, we, we obtain the following. So Rn of z minus Rn of z naught is in fact summation k greater or equal to n plus 1 a k z minus, sorry, z to the power k, z, okay. mm. correct? And so, <clears throat> remember that z to the power k minus z naught to the power k can be factorized in the following way, z minus z naught times z to the power k minus 1 plus z to the power k minus 2 z naught plus, plus 
z z naught k minus two plus c naught k minus two k minus one. Sorry. All right. Therefore, when considering this quotient here. Okay. We divide the factor of z minus z naught because z is different from z naught. It's taken different from z naught, and this is summation of a k. This correct. So now I take the modulus of this, and this is the modulus of this, and becomes smaller or equal to the modulus or to the sum of the moduli. Right? And so this is summation sum of a k. And then I have here how many, do, do you know how many uh, um, um, summons are in this uh, parenthesis? K elements, right? So I have that mod of z and mod of z naught, remember, are both smaller than rho and rho smaller than r. So when I consider the modulus, modulus of z and then the modulus of, of z naught, I can substitute, because I'm considering an inequality here, instead of z, modulus of z and modulus of z naught, modulus of, sorry, rho, okay? And notice here that the power of the moduli is precisely k minus one. So it becomes more equal to rho times k, correct? Okay. Okay, and uh, this is precisely the kth element of f1 at rho. And this is convergent. F1 is convergent. Hmm? So this number here can be made smaller than epsilon. It cannot diverge. It is actually convergent to something which is zero. Hmm? Because rho becomes very small. Hmm? So this is more than epsilon. So summing up these considerations, we can say that actually it's true that any power city expansion, for any power city expansion f of z, and when considering the, what we say, the derived power expansion, we have the following, that this is more than epsilon as uh, an z minus z naught is smaller than delta, and n is sufficiently large, right? Right? Good. So, first, a first important step in complex analysis is made. So, assume that we consider as a class of function we are interested in the class of function which are expressed in power series expansions. But these functions turn out to be differentiable in this, in this sense. So the limit of the incremental ratio exists and is finite. Good. Furthermore, we have this. From the derived power series, we can continue the, the same trick and consider the derived of the derived power expansion. There is no reason to consider this as the last. Huh? And applying the same argument, we conclude that actually it is, again, differentiable. And then we apply the same trick and argument to the derive of the right and so on and so forth. So any power is C infinity. Hmm? And there is an expression, if we use this to be the kth derivative, okay, this is the kth 
derived series. So this evaluated at the center of the power expansion at A, this turned out to be what? Well, thinking, uh, the, we have a, a, an example. If we evaluate the function at the center, we have only A naught. If we evaluate the derived function in A, in A we obtain A1. If we evaluate the function derived or derived in in A, we obtain 2A2. In general, we obtain K factorial AK, right? OK. So this is K factorial AK, which is also important to know. And in general, what we have, in fact, is the following, that FK, so the Kth derived series, derived series, has this expansion, something like factorial AK plus K plus 1 factorial AK plus 1 C minus A plus K uh, this is also important because when we apply this to our consideration, for instance, to the function exponential, we obtain the following important example. Remember that A of Z was the function, one of the example of uh, power expansion of, of a complex, uh, say, complex value functions defined in terms of power series expansion with the radius of coverage infinite. And the coefficients were given as follows, 1 plus Z plus Z squared. 2 factorial plus, plus Zn over n factorial, correct? <coughs> the coefficient were real, but well, it's just by chance in some sense, okay? Uh, now we can say, well, this function is differentiable in the complex sense, and we know that what <coughs> that is, it's the right function is the function which has the following expression, 1 plus z plus z squared over 2 factorial plus zn over n factorial. OK, so we actually have that function exponential solves this equation, differential equation, with the initial condition, like in the real case. Well, do we have other examples of function with the real coefficient which can be, can be extended to the complex case? Well, for instance, why not? Let's try with the trigonometric function, see? Cosine and sine. We remember that cosine of uh, x was 1 minus x squared over 2 plus x squared. Four, four minus, huh? By the way, x is real, right? Uh, sorry, two factorial, sorry. Hmm? Sorry, yes. The coefficients were all real, so again, we just by similarity, we can say, well, we extend to the complex case and put this way. This is a definition, right? 1 minus z square over 2 factorial plus z power 4, 4 factorial minus blah, blah, blah. And similarly, we find sine of z to be z <coughs> minus 3 factorial plus and so on, OK? This is, by definition, another function. So I invite you to verify the following. First, verify that the radius of convergence of, so that R, radius of convergence, sorry, of 
sinus and cosinus is infinite. Again, and furthermore, verify the derived series of cos is sin and sin is sorry is minus sin and the of sin is cos hmm? like in the real case so this is an exercise. Now we have a relationship between cos, sinus, sine, and exponential in the complex case. Nothing similar is in the real case. Okay, another similarity with the real case is the following: we take cos square of z plus sin see when this is equal to 1. What we don't have is the following. You consider E i z plus E minus i z. Remember the i and minus i is the property that i squared. So for all powers, positive powers, odd or even, they are negative, positive with i in front or minus 1, right? So I take this and divide by 2, and this is, prove it, cos of c. So prove Simply substitute in the definitions of the two, the two power series, okay? And similarly, 2i, e i z minus e minus z should be this, right? This is, and from the two equality here, we conclude the following. We have, first, that EIZ is 2 cos Z minus E minus IZ. And you have EIZ is 2I Z plus E I minus IZ. Then I sum the two. Relations and I obtain that the EIZ as cos C plus I, which is very important to know. In particular, when we restrict Z to the reals, you obtain the famous Euler relations. EIT is cos T plus I. Okay? Very importantly. So, <clears throat> what is difficult to prove also in the real case? In general, what is difficult to prove when you, you, you start dealing with uh, power expansions is the fact that when you multiply, you have a mass. Huh? <laughs> um, but what is surprisingly uh, true is that, in fact, for some power series expansions, like the exponential, you have good properties, and so that the coefficient mix are mixed, but they are mixed well. And this, uh, as a consequence, as a consequence implies, for instance, that if you take e to the power a plus b, this is equal to e power a times e power b. So following the traditional power rules, okay? Rules of, of uh, you learn in primary school, right? But it's difficult to prove it in general, all right? You have to, to, to make some calculation, to make some consideration about the convergence, so on and so forth. 
So <coughs> what, is <coughs> what is not surprising is that in the complex case, you actually have the same property. But in order to prove this, I want to make some more general consideration about derivation in the complex world. And we will see the, this property as a consequence of the, uh, the, the, the properties of derivative and derivation in the complex, uh, in the complex setting. So let me, first of all, use this notation, which will be the same for the entire course, and, and which is quite standard in many books. So we have a complex valued function of complex variable. So we assume that f is defined in an open set u of c, and its values are in c, OK? So we take as variable z, which is, since c is like r2, also written as x plus i y. x is the real part, and y is the imaginary part of the complex number z, correct? So similarly, the function f has two components, the real component and the marginal component, right? Therefore, we write f of z to be the sums of two real valued functions of complex variable. Call them typically u and v. So I recall here, u is a function from real valued function, and V as well, real valued function. Sometimes you can also find this just to use the same symbols for the variable and for the components of the function. So after using these notations, we can consider the function from u into c as a function from an open set of R2 into R2 with two components. Instead of calling them as you normally do in the real case, f1, f2, we call them u and v. Right? Well, now, let us assume that f um, has complex differentiable at z naught in u. This means that the limit as h tends to 0 of h f z naught plus h minus z naught over h exists and is finite. And normally denoted by f, f prime of z naught. This, if you want, is a definition. We say that f is complex differential at z naught if the limit of the incremental ratio is, exists and is finite. Nothing different from the real case, if you want. Pardon me? U, yeah. Yeah, sure. If you assume that f is defined in u, z naught has to be in u. Otherwise, this is not, there is no meaning. So you start from a function defined in an open set. You take a point inside this open set, and you consider the limit. OK, h, since h tends to 0, we can assume that h is in a smaller neighborhood of z naught in such a way that this smaller neighborhood is contained in u. And this is not a restriction, because we are assuming that, that, that h is. So that this is defined, right? Do we have examples of functions which are differentiable in the complex sense? Yes, we do. All functions which, have, which are defined as power series. 
So we have examples. But what does this definition imply? This definition implies many things. First of all, there is no assumption about the choice of h. h can be any number tending to 0. So remember that on the real line, when you assume that x, a real number, tends to a value x0, you can approach x0 from the left or from the right, correct? So in fact, we normally define the left limit and the right limit, and we said that if the two limits coincide, then this, this is the limit. It can be different. And the complex plane, z0 is a point in the plane, and we have infinitely many directions along which you can converge to this point. So we are not assuming that a privileged direction is assumed, nothing is assumed. So for instance, we can restrict our consideration to an incremental ratio along the reals or along the pure imaginary numbers. So let us take as h tend to 0, h real. In the definition of conflict differentiability, nothing is assumed about h. The only hypothesis you have to take is that h is coming closer to zero. So in this particular case, we have that considering f of c0 plus h and using the notation real and imaginary part of c0 to be x0 plus i, y0, and of z in, ge in general, x plus i, y, we have the following. This is f of x0 plus h plus i, y0. But remember that f was also as u of x0 plus h, y0. <coughs> When we consider the two functions u and v, the real and imaginary part of f, to be dependent on z, or if you want to look at the real structure behind the complex numbers, depending on x and y. So that if I take the incremental ratio, With the assumption that h is real, we have the following. We have that this becomes u of x0 plus h, y0 plus i plus h, y0. Minus u of x0, y0. Or, if we divide it properly, we have u of x0 plus h minus u x0 y0 over h plus i x0 plus h y0 minus x0 y0 over h. So the, the study is reduced to the real case because this is a real valid function and these are the two components of the real and imaginary part of the complex variable. So that here we have a ratio of real numbers and this is represented in the real calculus by what? By the derivative with respect to x at x, x, uh, x naught of the function u, right? So if you want to use this, this is the notation, right? 
And here I have I times, well, the same derivative with respect to x of the component, second component, and evaluated in x naught. Okay, for the sake of simplicity, since we will have uh, many derivatives with respect to x, to y, and so on, I prefer to use this. A shortcut, okay, in our in our consideration. So I put an uh, an index x, and then and with this I mean derivative with respect to x. If you don't mind, this is somehow uh, quite common, in, especially in uh, in uh, differential geometry, in order to avoid all these notations. Okay. Well, <coughs> so the next step is course, to consider what if instead of taking, as I said, h to be real, h uh, purely imaginary. So in this case, I have something different. If you think we have the same um, pattern in some sense, but the, this time the increment is made along y instead of along x, right? So I take h tilde to be um, to be sorry to be um, to be something like this i time h and h real right and in this case the incremental ratio which starts from is the following. which becomes, using the notation so far introduced, as follows. x naught, y naught plus h, minus Remember that we have h tilde in the denominator, plus i, the x naught, y naught, plus h minus v x naught y naught over h tilde. And h tilde is i h. In other words, this becomes, OK, i and i cancels. So the second part becomes what we expect to have. So the, the, the function, the, so the, the incremental ratio of the function v with respect to y. What about the first term? Minus i. Minus i, very good. Minus i because we have, well, 1 over i is, in fact, minus i. Right? <laughs> so I have minus i, and this is the same h. Okay, here and, and I disappears, <coughs> cancelled by the i here, and h in the denominator here gives you this. So when I take the limit as h tends to 0, so also h tilde tends to 0, this is the only way to make h tilde tends to 0, right? Right? So I have that the first. <coughs> Terms tends to okay minus i u with respect to y at x naught y naught plus v <coughs> v y sorry x naught y naught but the limit exists so the limit as h whatever h you take. Uh, as soon as it goes to zero, <laughs> huh? the limit exists and is the same, right? Independently on the choice of the way you are approaching zero. So the two, lim the two expressions have to be the same. So we have this important relations. Okay, this is number. 
and the calculation with h real, we obtain that f prime of z naught, yes, ux of z naught plus i, when h tilde was i h and h real, we have obtained what? f prime of z naught is v y of z naught minus i u y of z naught. Since the two, uh, the, the limit is the same, these two expressions are the same, and we obtain this important condition. u x at the z naught is y, z naught, sorry for z naught, and u y at z naught is minus x at z naught. Okay? And these two conditions are called Cauchy Riemann equations. We have to, so this is the real part, and this is the imaginary part, so uy is minus vx. So, uh, we can summarize what we have done so far in the following proposition, if f is complex differentiable, at z naught, then f satisfies Cauchy-Riemann equations at z naught. So the real and imaginary parts, the two real valued functions associated to f, have partial derivative with respect to x and to y, such that this Two conditions are satisfied. Okay? Well, important consequences of this. First of all, here, you see, we have made a direct um, calculation and obtained this property. From this, we also say, we can also say that. <coughs> Basic rules of, der of uh, derivations in the complex settings are inherited from the real case. So that if you sum two differentiable function at C0, then the derivative is the sum of the derivatives. Right? Because of the, the fact that here we are derivating with respect to x one real valued function. Okay? Then we have also Leibniz rule, chain rule, everything works fine. This is very important so that we don't have to somehow, uh, pardon me? We don't, ha we don't have to, 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 to get bothered with, you know, the, the standard stuff, okay? So we can use the same techniques we know from the real case. Probably most of you already know everything also in the complex case, but well, this is a exp simple explanation. Now, I want to characterize complex differentiable functions. We have examples, so the class is not empty, which is also important to, to know. The, you know, on, on the empty set, there are several theorems, very beautiful theorems, but normally they are not important. So we have a theory with something <laughs> inside. <laughs> You're too young to, to appreciate what I'm saying, but uh, there are some cases in which you have very long statements, and uh, so the only condition simply imply that there is nothing to, to talk about, okay? Okay, so the, the next task is the, to prove the following, to prove that any function, complex value functions, with real and imaginary part, which are differentiable, so in the, in, the real, in the real sense, which are the C1, assume, 
and which satisfy Cauchy-Riemann equation, they are in fact complex differentiable. So that we can characterize complex differentials are those functions which satisfy Cauchy-Riemann equations. Okay? So for the time being, we have the following. Power series expansion, so the general function as considered by the ancestors, our ancestors, okay, they were proved to be complex differentiable. And we also know that they are still power city expansion that we can apply several times and we have important relation. But okay, this guarantees that we have something concrete to work with. Now, starting from a complex differentiable function, from this very simple calculation, we have shown that in fact they satisfy some equations. So the real and imaginary part satisfy differential equations, which are called Cauchy Riemann equations. Now we start from the opposite side. Take two complex take one complex value complex valued function and consider the real and imaginary part to be sufficiently differential, at least C something, okay, C one. Okay, so that they have derivative and the derivative are continuous. And assume that they also uh, satisfy Cauchy Riemann equation. Can we prove that they are complex differentiable? Yes, we can. And by using all this stuff, we're, we're characterizing several ways complex differentiability. Okay? So let, them, let me continue by saying the following. Okay. Now, assumed F from an open set U of C into C as two um, components, as I the real and imaginary part to be U and V, to be <coughs> such that U and V are um, C1. So they have continuous partial derivatives and satisfy. Cauchy Riemann equations. Okay. Now I want to prove that this impli in fact implies that F, well, uh, this is done at one point. Okay, we assume that the functions are C1 in an able to C0, okay, and the Cauchy Riemann equations are satisfied at Z0. We want to prove that function F is completely differentiable at C0. Okay. Now, first of all, assume assume take this incremental ratio at the point x plus i y, so x y. Okay, this is purely real. This is a real valued function of two real variables, x and y. How can you express this difference in terms of a linear part and a rest? Can you do this? Yeah. Yeah, okay. How? <laughs> Ux of h. So you use the, the linear part, right? And so if you want, this is different, the, 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 the application of the notion of uh, differential, of gradient, okay, of, of a real valued function. So we have that this is, in fact, ux at x, y times x, by time h, sorry, plus u, y, x, y, sorry, k, plus call them, call the function, okay? And this function here 
as a property that this tends to zero as h and k tends to zero. Good. But we can say something more. We can say that as h plus i k tends to zero. Correct? So it is it tends to zero faster than h plus i k. So it means okay the the, the speed. <laughs> is, okay. Similarly, v x plus h y plus k minus v x y as v x x y h plus v y x, y, k plus psi h, k with a similar property. As h, k tends to 0. Remember, this is, well, a node, how do you say, small o of h and k. Right, of the modulus of aging. Okay. Now, we have these two uh, relationships for the real and imaginary part of the function f. Now, <coughs> we have to consider the following. F of C over. Okay. This is the complex increment we are considering. Hmm? Um, I don't know how can we write it. Could be well W W has real part H and the imaginary part k. Okay? Good. So this is, as before, x plus h, y plus k, plus i, v x plus h, y plus k, <coughs> minus u x, y minus i, v, x, y over h plus i, k. Correct? So this minus this is something which can be expressed in terms of a linear part and the rest, as we did before. So this, this two, u, x plus h, y plus k minus u of x, y is, in fact, u x h <coughs> u y x, y, k plus v h, k, right? And similarly, with an i in front, we have the difference we evaluated before, v x plus h y plus k minus vxy. So this is plus i vx xyh plus i vy xy k plus, sorry, say hk over h plus i k. Correct? And so far, we have only used the regularity of the function, not the fact that the functions u and v satisfy Cauchy-Riemann equations. But now, we split the two, well, we don't consider phi of psi because 
they are tending to zero as h and k tend to zero. So hmm, we're not interested in this. We're interested in this part here. And we have ux, x, y, h. And then I remember that uh, vy Ux and Vy are the same, right? Right? So I can factor out Ux and take Ik, H and Ik. And then I have also that Uy is minus Vx. Correct? So Uy is minus Vx. So here I have minus Vx, K, plus I, Vx, H, plus Phi, Psi, Psi, H plus I, K. But this is not important because this will tend to zero, right? Now, <coughs> minus Vx is also plus I squared. So I factor out I and I obtain finally that this is Ux, Xy. I simplify this and this. Then I have plus I and I collecting I, I have Vx, H, plus Ik. Vx, Xy, H, plus Ik, over. And then what is left is here. In other words, when consider this, Incremental ratio, which is the general setting with the assumption that u and v, real and imaginary part of the function f, satisfy Cauchy Riemann equation. Of course, they have to be at least uh, with partial derivatives, otherwise, we cannot <laughs> even be considered to, to solve the, 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 the to, be, to, be, to be satisfying the Cauchy Riemann equations. We obtain here that as h and k tends to 0, or as h plus i k tends to 0, this tends to 0, and what is left, what remains here, is precisely the derivative of f, as in the previous expression. So the derivative of the real part with respect to x plus i, the derivative of the imaginary part with respect to x. So we, I consider concluded that this proof, and then any complex valid function with Sufficiently regular real and imaginary part satisfying Cauchy Riemann equation is in fact complex differentiable. And this is one important consequence of the definition. Another important consequence is the following. Oh yeah. Assume that the function f has real imaginary part which turn out to be of class C2 in U. Okay, so f is defined sorry in U. I use capital U for the open set and uh, normal letter U to be okay. I'm sorry, but well this means a set and this means a function in any case. U and V, both of class C2, so they have also second partial derivatives with respect to X and with respect to I, with to Y. Now, consider this. Uh, the second derivative of, uh, of U with respect to X is also this according to my notation, okay? 
in short, and also this, for instance, okay, will be the notation I use so far. Correct? X and Y, X and Y, okay? And of course, all the others, so Y, X and uh, Y, Y. Hmm? All right? What is this? Let me see if you are familiar with this. This is the Laplacian of what? No, no. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, true. The Laplacian of U, sure. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> the Laplacian of U is normally denoted by okay, this symbol. This is the Laplacian. This second order differential operator is called Laplacian. This is just a name. How are called the solution of a Laplacian equal to zero? Harmonic functions. Very good. So this is completely real stuff, right? OK. What is one of the important consequences of the fact that you and and V being the real imaginary part of a complex value function, they satisfy Cauchy-Riemann equation. So as a consequence, we obtain that these two functions are, in fact, harmonic functions. How can we see this? But remember that we have this relation. U of x is V of y. OK, I write the Cauchy-Riemann equation once again. And u y is minus v of x, if I'm not mistaken, right? Therefore, if I take u x x, this is as v will be y x. Okay? And if I take u y y, this is like minus v x y. If I sum up the two, on the left hand side, I'll paint this u x x. Uy, y. On the right hand side, I obtain Vyx minus Vxy. However, if there are sufficient regular, that is to say C2 is enough, they have to be con with partial derivatives which are continuous at C0, then Schwarz, Schwarz, uh, Schwarz -Lehm, the theorem, implies that the order of derivation is uh, not important for the farm. Okay? So the, the partial the, the derivatives do not depend on the choice of the order of x and y. So this is 0. This is the same. How do you call the theorem? I call it Schwartz theorem. It should be short or something. There are several Schwartz in mathematical uh, history. There will be also a Schwartz lemma we'll see in, in complex. And it's not, it's not, I don't think it's the same Schwartz, by the way, the same man. I mean. In, in German, it means black. So it's a very common uh, family name. Anyhow, we conclude this for you. And similarly, I invite you to prove that this is also true. So this implies, OK, this is Laplacian. Laplacian equal to 0 is a consequence of the Schurman equation. So. In particular, we can say that <coughs> F complex differentiable implies its components are harmonic functions. Now, as a Matter of um, terminology, complex differentiable is quite a modern way to say this, to indicate this function. In fact, for several reasons, for historical reasons, they are more um, often called holomorphic function. Okay, so holomor a holomorphic function means complex differentiable. So that's the the standard 
terminology used in complex analysis. Harmonic function, harmonic and harmonic functions are instead, say, real calculus, real analysis terminology, okay, harmonic. And they, they, they also, the, the origin of this name, of this uh, specific name is, uh, has some reasons, okay, related to property of a room. If you, if you use the, the, the harmonic analysis, you, you, can, you can find some, well, something related to wave equations and so on, okay. Okay. Questions so far? So, <clears throat> You might ask why? Why all this long, long very long prelude to, to to very direct proof of, of something related to exponential and complex uh, uh, co cosine and sine? Well, because we also hope to, to use the tools we have so far to do so. And in analysis, without derivation, without this specific tools, you can do very little. In fact, this tells us a lot of things. You are, the, the entire theory related to the <laughs> derivation, right? Well, for instance, an important consequence in real analysis is that from the study of this, uh, of um, the, the, the study of the, in the in increasing or decreasing of the function depends on the positivity or negativity of the derivative, right? Because it is a real number, it can be positive, negative, or zero. Unfortunately, we cannot hope to have anything like this in the complex case because, well, complex numbers are not positive, negative, or, uh, but they can be zero, they can be zero. So what if the function is such that it's, it, it is complex differentiable, so it's harmonic, and it has its derivative equal to zero. What's your opinion about this? Everywhere? Yeah, in, a, in an open, it's constant. it's constant, like in the real case. Can, you, can we prove it directly without making many calculations? No, it's connected, not convex. It's connected. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Op okay. Normally, and it is quite natural to think of these sets as open and connected. Normally, functions which are holomorphic are supposed to be defined in a domain. Domain means open and connected set, subset of C. Why is it quite natural? Well, so far we have very few examples, but if you think that power series expansions define functions which are holomorphic, the radius of convergence can be big, large, or very small, but in, it doesn't matter. The, the, the set of definition is a circle, it's a disk. Therefore, it is an open and connected set. Yes, so since we are using this property to be uh, assumed for, for the domain, Opening, open set is natural because we have to, to deal with the derivative, so we have to have a neighborhood of a point, right? Why connectedness is important as well? Well, because probably the, the argument relies upon something which is topological, okay? So let us see it in detail, if you don't mind. Or do you have, do you have an, an, another, another way to think about it? Any opinion? Well, we should also try to find a shortcut. Remember that the derivative, the complex derivative, is expressed in terms of the ux plus ivx, right? So if it is identically zero, there is no increment of the real part and the imaginary part of the function along the real axis. But it is also minus uy Sorry, sorry, minus Vy, so Vy minus I Uy. So it is also constants along the imaginary axis. And any two points can be joined by a polygon, by a path, 
with vertical or horizontal lines as segments. This is also a proof. You are right, but th th this is a step too, too, too long for the moment. Yes, <laughs> all right. But it's direct. Yes, but you have to prove the, the Cauchy integral formula first, right? <laughs> yes, but in fact, uh, in a in in few hours, say, we have this special tool, the Cauchy integral formula, because as a consequence of the Cauchy integral, which is very peculiar in uh, complex analysis, will resemble something which is, uh, say, the opposite way what we have done. We will consider power series expansion and prove to be dif complex differentiable, holomorphic. Mm -hmm. Now we start from the opposite, and equivalently to have, to have a real imaginary part satisfying cauchy riemann equation. Now we start from a function which is complex differentiable or satisfy cauchy riemann equation. Is it true that it is complex analytic, so it has a power expansion. And it's true, in fact, but it depends on Cauchy integral formula. So we introduce uh, this important tool, so I don't know, maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So, but if you, if you, yes. A uh, equal every z in C uh, such that f z zero equal f z. We prove uh, this is uh, closed and open. Sure. C. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Your colleague is uh, is uh, uh, how to say is uh, trying to to use another argument, but that is the very. So, uh, detailed argument to prove that the function, which is complex differentiable and its derivative equal to zero, is in fact constant. So he said, why don't we use the following argument? We consider the level set. We take a point inside this open and connected set, consider the value of the function. So, it is, if, if, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, please tell me. So, we consider u to be open and connected, connected, take A in U, F of course, U, holomorphic, okay, and assume that F prime, so the derivative is zero for any Z in U. So your colleague is saying, why don't we consider <coughs> this value, f of a, a is a point in u, f of a is well defined, and consider the counter image huh, of a, inverse image. a to be the set of z in u such that f of z is equal to f of a, correct? So I think that, well, A is, of course, not empty because there is at least one point. And since it is a level set, set of, huh, it's the inverse image of a function, which is, I didn't say it, but of course it is continuous. We have partial derivatives of the components, so that it is continuous, OK? Continuity is a consequence of differentiability also in the, oh, in the complex case because, well, I didn't say it, I didn't write it explicitly. If you consider the incremental ratio and you know that the limit existence is finite, then of course f of z tends of f of z naught as z tends to z naught, right? It cannot be anything else. Otherwise, the limit is not finite. Huh? Anyhow. Since it is continuous, this is also, in short, f minus 1 of a. So it is the inverse image of my point, and it is a closed set. OK? So a is closed. 
what is left to prove? If, if we prove that A is also open, okay, we have a non-empty open and closed set, so it is the entire U. Which means that for any Z in U, F of Z is equal to F A, so it is constant. And, we, and we're finished. So to prove this, we have, well, to prove that, that A is open, and thank you for, for your observation, uh, we, we do the following. So we, we have U, we have A, and we take a, an open ball of radius R centered <coughs> at A and with a small radius in such a way that it is contained in U. Okay? This can be done. Is it? I want to take Z in BA of R and prove that Z is actually in A. If this is done, I'm finished because I've proved that any point in A has a neighborhood in A. And so A is also open. So how we conclude? So this is, sorry. So the last part of the argument, I take okay, I take Z and I take A. And I take the line, the segment, connecting Z to A. So remember that Z and A can be considered as vectors. So I can use well standard stuff like this, like well what is it? T Z plus 1 minus T A, right? And T real. Actually, T real in between 0 and 1. So when T is 0, this number here is A. When T is 1, this number here is Z. So this is the segment connecting A to Z, right? Then I consider F of Tz plus 1 minus Ta and call it G of T. So A and Z are given. I take Z in the ball. A is the point we have considered from the beginning. So what varies here is the, 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 the parameter T, which is real parameter. So G is a complex value function Define on zero one. All right? Good. Now, <coughs> what can I say about? Uh, well, why? Uh, one point I forgot to say. <laughs> why can I take T Z plus one minus T A to be a good variable for F? So, because I'm considering Z to be in the ball center at A, right? It is convex, correct. Right? So the entire segment is in the ball. Perfect, perfect. And so F is defined for any T. So G is well defined. Now I consider G of T minus G of S over T minus S. So this is an incremental ratio. Hmm? Is it? For G. Uh, okay, so uh, Tz plus 1 minus Ta minus F of Sz plus 1 minus Sa over T minus Z, T minus S. Then I notice that if I write Tz plus 1 minus Ta, which is the first, in the first, um, which is G, which is, uh, sorry, which is uh, what is the variable for F in here. Then I subtract here, what is in here, minus S, S, 
S z plus 1 minus S a, I obtain, notice that I have a and a and a minus in front here. So n, a and a cancels, where I have dz minus sz, and then I have minus da plus sa. So I have t minus s, z minus a. OK? Are you with me? Just, just, just as a matter of it's very simple calculation. Okay. So that I can rewrite with this observation, rewrite this as f of t z plus one minus t a minus f s z plus one minus s a over, and I write t s z minus a, which is exactly the difference of what we have here and here. And then I multiply for the same amount. And then divide by t minus s, right? So this cancels this. And this is, <coughs> since this is t z plus 1 minus t a minus SC plus 1 minus, minus SA, and this is an incremental ratio for F. Now, when T tends to Z, this tends to 0, and this tends to what? To F prime at SZ plus 1 minus SA, which is 0. Correct? Good. So, in the last few minutes, I will conclude by saying that, so as t tends to s, we have the gt minus g of s, t minus s, tends to f prime of s z plus 1 minus s a time z minus a z minus a, right? But this is 0, because this point is inside, right? It, it is in u in particular, so it is 0. Which means that this function here, g of z, is constant, and g of 0 is g of 1. So g is constant. And g of 0 is what? f of a, and g of 1 is f of z. That is what I wanted to prove. And this concludes the proof. Very good. Because we are assuming that the set is open connected. Well, we found an open and, and closed set inside a, a connected set and non empty set, right? So it is entire u. Now, how can we apply this to have the relationship we are? we were looking for. So consider this function. As a function of z. c is a complex number. And e, the power c, is the exponential, the complex exponential. So this function turns out to be complex differentiable. And this turns out to be complex differentiable as well. Correct? Because, the, well, you just shift the center of the power expansion of U of Z. You make it, so we have all the hypotheses. So what about the derivative? Is it 0? Are you all? It's e to the power c, correct. Correct? But not because we are using the property, because we made a calculation, right? <laughs> Don't, I'm not cheating you, right? <laughs> I'm saying, well, if you want to be very formal, use what we know, not what you, we, we want to know, OK? <laughs> You're right, but 
Okay, just, just, it's just a test just to verify that we can do this. Now we apply Leibniz rule because we have a multiplication of complex differential function and we apply Leibniz rule. So it means that we have to differentiate first this times this function and then this function times the, the derivative of the other. But the derivative of e of z for definition is e of z. So it's e of z times e, c minus z plus then I have e of z, the function, times the derivative of this. Okay. Remember that, as I said, we can use standard rules. So we have a composition of functions. Here we have minus 1 in front, minus 1 is the coefficient, and then e c minus z. So it is 0. So the function is, in fact, constant. And in particular, e, as I said, of 0 is e c minus 0, f of 0, and it is the value at 0 is c of the power c. So we have this relationship, and this concludes today's lesson. Then we have that e z times e c minus z is e c. Okay. I call z equal to a, c minus z equal to b. So c is <coughs> a plus b, correct? So we have a e a times c b. Right, so in particular, just if z is x plus i y, e z is e x plus i y, and it is e x times e i y. But e i y, but e i y is this y is remember real number as x eh? times cos y plus i y. And once again, we obtain something interesting. We obtain it, the, the, the modulus of V of Z is E X to the power X, which is a non-negative real number. And Y represents the argument. Not just one hundred degrees. Pardon me? Positive. Pardon me? No, I didn't. E to the power X. Sorry, it's strict, strictly positive, right, correct. Correct. So, E of correct. Sorry, sorry. Right. Sure. That's what I want to say. E of x is strictly positive, and therefore we can say that E of z is never zero. Never vanishes. And as you will see, this is somehow the extremal, or the extremal property. It's the only function. Well, one of the, well, doesn't. Well, we'll see what happens in the future, but it's the only value which is missed by, by the function e to the power z, the complex plane, right? So I think that we can stop here and see you tomorrow morning, okay? And I prepared the, the, the copies for you tomorrow, if you don't mind. Huh?